Part 2 Chapter 1 It was the middle of the morning and Winston had left his cubicle to go to the lavatory. A solitary figure was coming towards him from the other end of the long, brightly lit corridor. It was the girl with dark hair. Four days had gone past since the evening when he had run into her outside the junk shop. As she came nearer, he saw that her right arm was in a sling, not noticeable at a distance because it was of the same colour as her overalls. Probably she had crushed her hand while swinging round one of the big kaleidoscopes on which the plots of novels were roughed in. It was a common accident in the fiction department. They were perhaps four metres apart when the girl stumbled and fell almost flat on her face. A sharp cry of pain was wrung out of her. She must have fallen right on her injured arm. Winston stopped short. The girl had risen to her knees. Her face had turned a milky yellow colour against which her mouth stood out redder than ever. Her eyes were fixed on his, with an appealing expression that looked more like fear than pain. A curious emotion stirred in Winston's heart. In front of him was an enemy who was trying to kill him. In front of him also was a human creature, in pain and perhaps with a broken bone. Already he had instinctively started forward to help her. In the moment when he had seen her fall on the bandaged arm, it had been as though he felt the pain in his own body. You're hurt, he said. It's nothing. My arm, it'll be right in a second. She spoke as though her heart were fluttering. She had certainly turned very pale. You haven't broken anything? No, I'm, I'm all right. It hurt for a moment, that's all. She held out her free hand to him and he helped her up. She had regained some of her colour and appeared very much better. It's nothing, she repeated shortly. I only gave my wrist a bit of a bang. Thanks, comrade. And with that she walked on in the direction in which she had been going as briskly as though it had really been nothing. The whole incident could not have taken as much as half a minute. Not to let one's feelings appear in one's face was a habit that had acquired the status of an instinct, and in any case, they had been standing straight in front of a telescreen when the thing happened. Nevertheless, it had been very difficult not to betray momentary surprise, for in the two or three seconds while he was helping her up, the girl had slipped something into his hand. There was no question that she had done it intentionally. It was something small and flat. As he passed through the lavatory door, he transferred it to his pocket and felt it with the tips of his fingers. It was a scrap of paper folded into a square. While he stood at the urinal, he managed, with a little more fingering, to get it unfolded. Obviously, there must be a message of some kind written on it. For a moment, he was tempted to take it into one of the water closets and read it at once. But that would be shocking folly, as he well knew. There was no place where you could be more certain that the telescreens were watched continuously. He went back to his cubicle, sat down through the fragment of paper casually among the other papers on the desk, put on his spectacles and hitched the speak rack towards him. Five minutes, he told himself. Five minutes at the very least. His heart bumped in his breast with frightening loudness. Fortunately, the piece of work he was engaged on was mere routine, the rectification of a long list of figures not needing close attention. Whatever was written on the paper, it must have some kind of political meaning. So far as he could see, there were two possibilities. One, much more likely, was that the girl was an agent of the Thought Police, just as he had feared. He did not know why the Thought Police should choose to deliver their messages in such a fashion but perhaps they had their reasons. The thing that was written on the paper might be a threat, a summons, an order to commit suicide, a trap of some description. But there was another, wilder possibility that kept raising through his head, though he tried vainly to suppress it. This was that the message did not come from the Thought Police at all, but from some kind of underground organisation. Perhaps the Brotherhood existed after all. Perhaps the girl was a part of it, no doubt the idea was absurd, but it had sprung into his mind in the very instant of feeling the scrap of paper in his hand. It was not till a couple of minutes later that the other more probable explanation had occurred to him. And even now, 
though his intellect told him that the message probably meant death. Still, that was not what he believed, and the unreasonable hope persisted, and his heart banged. And it was with a difficulty that he kept his voice from trembling as he murmured his figures into the speakwrite. He rolled up the completed bundle of work and slid it into the pneumatic tube. Eight minutes had gone by. He readjusted his spectacles on his nose, sighed, and drew the next batch of work towards him with a scrap of paper on top of it. He flattened it out. On it was written, in large, unformed handwriting, I love you. For several seconds he was too stunned even to throw the incriminating thing into the memory hole. When he did so, although he knew very well the danger of showing too much interest, he could not resist reading it once again, just to make sure the words were really there. For the rest of the morning it was very difficult to work. What was even worse than having to focus his mind on a series of niggling jobs was the need to conceal his agitation from the teddy screen. He felt as though a fire were burning in his belly. Lunch in the hot, crowded, noise-filled canteen was torment. He had hoped to be alone for a little while during the lunch hour. But as bad luck would have it, the imbecile Parsons flopped down beside him, the tang of his sweat almost deafening in the tinny smell of stew, and kept up a stream of talk about the preparations for hate week. He was particularly enthusiastic about a paper mache model of Big Brother's head, two metres wide, which was being made for the occasion by his daughter's troop of spies. The irritating thing was that in the racket of voices, Winston could hardly hear what Parsons was saying, and was constantly having to ask for some fatuous remark to be repeated. Just once, he caught a glimpse of the girl, at a table with other two girls at the far end of the room. She appeared not to have seen him, and he did not look in that direction again. The afternoon was more bearable. Immediately after lunch, there arrived a delicate, difficult piece of work which would take several hours and necessitated putting everything else aside. It consisted in falsifying a series of production reports of two years ago, in such a way as to cast discredit on a prominent member of the inner party who was now under a cloud. This was the kind of thing that Winston was good at, and for more than two hours he succeeded in shutting the girl out of his mind altogether. Then the memory of her face came back, and with it a raging, intolerable desire to be alone. Until he could be alone. It was impossible to think this new development out. Tonight was one of his nights at the community centre. He wolfed another tasteless meal in the canteen, hurried off to the centre, took part in the solemn foolery of a discussion group, played two games of table tennis, swallowed several glasses of gin, and sat for half an hour through a lecture entitled Ingsoc in relation to chess. His soul writhed with boredom, but for once he had no impulse to shirk his evening at the centre. At the sight of the words, I love you, the desire to stay alive had welled up in him, and the taking of minor risks suddenly seemed stupid. It was not till twenty-three hours when he was home and in a bed, in the darkness where you were safe even from the telescreen so long as you kept silent, that he was able to think continuously. It was a physical problem that had to be solved, how to get in touch with the girl and arrange a meeting, he did not consider any longer the possibility that she might be laying some kind of trap for him. He knew that it was not so, of her unmistakable agitation when she handed him the note. Obviously she had been frightened out of her wits, as well she might be. Nor did the idea of refusing her advances even cross his mind. Only five nights ago he had contemplated smashing her skull with a cobblestone, but that was of no importance. He thought of her naked, youthful body as he had seen it in his dream. He had imagined her a fool like the rest of them, her head stuffed with lies and hatred, her belly full of ice. A kind of fever seized him at the thought that he might lose her. The white youthful body might slip away from him. What he feared more than anything else was that she would simply change her mind if he did not get in touch with her quickly. But the physical difficulty of meeting was enormous. It was like trying to make a move at chess when you were already mated. Whichever way you turned, the telescreen faced you. Actually, all the possible ways of communicating with her had occurred to him within five minutes of reading the note. But now, with time to think, he went over them one by one, as though laying out a row of instruments on a table. Obviously, the kind of encounter that had happened this morning could not be repeated. If she had worked in the records department, it might have been comparatively simple, but... 
but he had only a very dim idea whereabouts in the building the fiction department lay, and he had no pretext for going there. If he had known where she lived and at what time she left work, he could have contrived to meet her somewhere on her way home. But to try to follow her home was not safe, because it would mean loitering about outside the ministry, which was bound to be noticed. As for sending a letter through the mails, it was out of the question. By a routine that was not even secret, all letters were opened in transit. Actually, few people even wrote letters. For the messages that it was occasionally necessary to send, there were printed postcards with long lists of phrases, and you struck out the ones that were inapplicable. In any case, he did not know the girl's name, let alone her address. Finally, he decided that the safest place was the canteen. If he could get her at a table by herself, somewhere in the middle of the room, not too near the telescreens, and with a sufficient buzz of conversation all around. If these conditions endured for, say, 30 seconds, it might be possible to exchange a few words. For a week after this, life was like a restless dream. On the next day, she did not appear in the canteen until he was leaving it, the whistle having already blown. Presumably, she had changed onto a later shift. They passed each other without a glance. On the day after, she was in the canteen at the usual time, but with three other girls and immediately under a telescreen. Then for three dreadful days she did not appear at all. His whole mind and body seemed to be afflicted with an unbearable sensitivity, a sort of transparency which made every movement, every sound, every contact, every word that he had to speak or listen to in agony. Even in sleep he could not altogether escape from her image. He did not touch the diary during those days. If there was any relief it was in his work in which he could sometimes forget himself for ten minutes a stretch. He had absolutely no clue as to what had happened to her. There was no inquiry he could make. She might have been vaporised. She might have committed suicide. She might have been transferred to the other end of Oceana. Worst and likeliest of all, she might simply have changed her mind and decided to avoid him. The next day she reappeared. Her arm was out of the sling, and she had a band of sticking plaster around her wrist. The relief of seeing her was so great that he could not resist staring at her directly for several seconds. On the following day, he very nearly succeeded in speaking to her. When he came into the canteen, she was sitting at a table well out of the wall and was quite alone. It was early and the place was not very full. The queue edged forward till Winston was almost at the counter, then was held up for two minutes because someone in front was complaining that he had not received his tablet of saccharin but the girl was still alone when Winston secured his tray and began to make for her table. He walked casually towards her, his eyes searching for a place at some table beyond her. She was perhaps three metres away from him. Another two seconds would do it. Then a voice behind him called. Smith! He pretended not to hear. Smith! repeated the voice more loudly. It was no use. He turned round. A blonde-headed, silly-faced young man named... Wilshire, whom he barely knew, was inviting him with a smile to a vacant place at his table. It was not safe to refuse. After having been recognised, he could not go and sit at a table with an unattended girl. It was too noticeable. He sat down with a friendly smile. The silly blonde face beamed into his. Winston had a hallucination of himself smashing a pickaxe right into the middle of it. The girl's table filled up a minute later but she must have seen him coming towards her, and perhaps she would take the hint. Next day he took care to arrive early. Sure enough, she was at the table in the same place, and again alone. The person immediately ahead of him in the queue was a small, swiftly moving beetle-like man with a flat face and tiny, suspicious eyes. As Winston turned away from the counter with his tray, he saw the little man was making straight for the girl's table. His hopes sank again. There was a vacant place at a table further away, but something in the little man's appearance suggested that he would be sufficiently attentive to his own comfort to choose the emptiest table. With ice in his heart, Winston followed. It was no use unless he could get the girl alone. At this moment there was a tremendous crash. The little man was sprawling on all fours. His tray had gone flying. Two streams of soup and coffee were flowing across the floor. He started to his feet with a malignant glance at Winston, whom he evidently suspected of having tripped him up, but it was all right. Five seconds later, with a 
thundering heart, Winston was sitting at the girl's table. He did not look at her. He unpacked his tray and promptly began eating. It was all important to speak at once, before anyone else came, but now a terrible fear had taken possession of him. A week had gone by since she had first approached him. She must have changed her mind. It was impossible that this affair should end successfully. Such things did not happen in real life. He might have flinched altogether from speaking if at this moment he had not seen ample forth, the hairy-eared poet, wandering limply round the room with a tray, looking for a place to sit down. In his vague way, Ampleforth was attached to Winston and would certainly sit down at his table if he caught sight of him. There was perhaps a minute in which to act. Both Winston and the girl were eating steadily. The stuff they were eating was a thin stew, actually a soup of haricot beans. In a low murmur, Winston began speaking. Neither of them looked up. Steadily they spooned the watery stuff into their mouths, and between spoonfuls exchanged a few necessary words in low, expressionless voices. What time do you leave work? 18.30. Where can we meet? Victory Square near the monument. It's full of telescreens. It doesn't matter if there's a crowd. Any signal? No. Don't come up to me until you see me among a lot of people. And don't look at me. Just keep somewhere near me. What time? Nineteen hours. All right. Ampleforth failed to see Winston and sat down at another table. They did not speak again. And so far as it was possible for two people sitting on opposite sides of the same table, they did not look at one another. The girl finished her lunch quickly and made off while Winston stayed to smoke a cigarette. He wandered round the base of the enormous fluted column, at the top of which Big Brother's statue gazed southward toward the skies where he had vanquished the Eurasian aeroplanes, the East Asian aeroplanes it had been a few years ago, in the Battle of Airstrip 1. In the street in front of it there was a statue of a man on horseback, which was supposed to represent Oliver Cromwell. At five minutes past the hour, the girl had still not appeared. Again the terrible fear seized upon Winston. She was not coming. She had changed her mind. He walked slowly up the north side of the square and got a sort of pale-coloured pleasure from identifying St Martin's Church, whose bells, when it had bells, had chimed. You owe me three farthings. Then he saw the girl standing at the base of the monument, reading or pretending to read a poster which ran spirally to the column. It was not safe to go near her until some more people had accumulated. There were telescreens all around the pediment, but at the moment there was a din of shouting and a zoom of heavy vehicles from somewhere to the left. Suddenly everyone seemed to be running across the square. The girl nipped nimbly round the lines at the base of the monument and joined in the rush. Winston followed. As he ran, he gathered from some shouted remarks that a convoy of Eurasian prisoners were passing. Already a dense mass of people was blocking the south side of the square. Winston, at normal times, the kind of person who gravitates to the outer edge of any kind of scrimmage, shoved, butted, squirmed his way forward into the heart of the crowd. Soon he was within arm's length of the girl, but the way was blocked by an enormous prol and an almost equally enormous woman presumably his wife, who seemed to form an impenetrable wall of flesh. Winston wriggled himself sideways, and with a violent lunge managed to drive his shoulder between them. For a moment it felt as though his entrails were being ground to pulp between the two muscular hips. Then he had broken through, swearing a little. He was next to the girl. They were shoulder to shoulder, both staring fixedly in front of them. A long line of trucks with wooden-faced guards armed with submachine guns standing upright in each corner was passing slowly down the street. In the trucks, little yellow men in shabby greenish uniforms were squatting, jammed close together. Their sad Mongolian faces gazed out over the sides of the trucks, utterly incurious. Occasionally, when a truck jolted, there was a clank-clank of metal. All the prisoners were in leg irons. Truckload after truckload of the sad faces passed. Winston knew they were there. But he saw them only intermittently. The girl's shoulder and her right arm down to the elbow were pressed against his. His cheek was almost near enough for him to feel its warmth. She had immediately taken charge of the situation, 
just as she had done in the canteen. She began speaking in the same expressionless voice as before, with lips barely moving, a mere murmur easily drowned by the din of voices and the rumbling of the trucks. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you get Sunday afternoon off? Yes. Then listen carefully. You'll have to remember this. Go to Paddington Station. With a sort of military precision that astonished him, she outlined the route that he was to follow. A half-hour railway journey. Turn left outside the station. Two kilometres along the road. A gate with a top bar missing. A path across a field. A grass-grown lane. A track between bushes. A dead tree with moss on it. It was as though she had a map inside her head. Can you remember all that? She murmured finally. Yes. You turn left, then right, then left again. And the gate's got no top bar. Yes. Yes, what time? About fifteen. You may have to wait. I'll get there by another way. Are you sure you remember everything? Yes. Then get away from me as quick as you can. She need not have told him that. But for the moment, they could not extricate themselves from the crowd. The trucks were still filing past, the people still insatiably gaping. At the start, there had been a few boos and hisses, but it came only from the party members among the crowd, and had soon stopped. The prevailing emotion was simply curiosity. Foreigners, whether from Eurasia or from East Asia, were a kind of strange animal. One literally never saw them except in the guise of prisoners, and even as prisoners one never got more than a momentary glimpse of them. Nor did one know what become of them, apart from the few that were hanged as war criminals. The others simply vanished, presumably into forced labour camps. The round Mongol faces had given way to faces of a more European type, dirty, bearded and exhausted. From over scrubby cheekbones, eyes looked over into Winston's, sometimes with strange intensity, and flashed away again. The convoy was drawing to an end. In the last truck he could see an aged man, his face a mass of grizzled hair, standing upright with wrists crossed in front of him, as though he were used to having them bound together. It was almost time for Winston and the girl to part, but at the last moment, while the crowd still hemmed them in, her hand felt for his and gave it a fleeting squeeze. It could not have been ten seconds, and yet it seemed like a long time that their hands were clasped together, he had time to learn every detail of her hand. He explored the long fingers, the shapely nails, the work-hardened palm with its row of calluses, the smooth flesh under the wrist. Merely from feeling it, he would have known it by sight. In the same instant it occurred to him that he did not know what colour the girl's eyes were. They were probably brown, but people with dark hair sometimes had blue eyes. To turn his head and look at her would have been inconceivable folly. With hands locked together, invisible among the press of bodies, they stared steadily in front of them. And instead of the eyes of the girl, the eyes of the aged prisoner gazed mournfully at Winston, out of nests of hair.